so I'm here with Pankaj Kapahi, and he does caloric restriction and uh, metabolism research at the Buck Institute. Um, and he's been doing this work for a while. Uh, he's recently come across a pretty interesting discovery related to advanced glycation end products and caloric restriction. And he wants to talk about it here. So um, I'll let him start out with just some background about what he, his research is and what he's been doing. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, my lab's been studying caloric restriction now for almost two decades. Uh, when I was a postdoc, we identified that the target of rap rapamycin, the uh, uh, TOR pathway, is uh, mimics the effects of caloric uh, diet restriction in using Drosophila. And, and that's um, um, now at least panned out very well as a sort of a, uh, an intervention to extend health span in multiple species. Um, and uh, since then, we've been looking for other mechanisms of uh, uh, diet restriction. And, and during this time, you know, I have myself practiced uh, caloric restriction and now more intermittent fasting, because I think that's a very um, a practically a very good way to do it. Um, and, and I've realized the hardest part is really doing caloric restriction. I mean, we understand caloric, we understand a lot more about caloric restriction, but we, we have very little um, knowledge of how to put it into practice in people. And that's where I think the, the latest work we are doing around advanced glycation end products is, is very exciting and is was more of an accident. While we were studying the mechanisms of aging and very uh, interested in how with age and with, uh, with diabetes, you enhance glycation and then how that uh, accelerates aging. Um, we identified by accident that having more advanced glycation end products also makes you overeat. So it fits very well this whole idea of like, you know, overeating um, and then causing obesity and diabetic uh, um, uh, diabetes and then driving diabetic, diabetic complications. Yeah. Okay. So, um... You, you were looking at advanced location end products. Was there any specific um, advanced location end product that you guys were looking at? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually, because the, the term is generally used for um, um, the, the process of glycation, which is generally amino acids reacting with different types of sugars. And that's a, a big class of molecules. We're focusing on methylglyoxal, which is a spontaneous uh, product of glycolysis. So every time two, glu two glucose, um, um, a glucose splits into two, three carbon atoms, you form methyl methylglyoxal non-enzymatically. And the idea is this builds up uh, with age and it, it has the capability of attacking lysines, arginines, and even cysteines, and, uh, and uh, attacks both, you know, attacks proteins, lipids, and uh, DNA. Um, so We've been really uh, interested in just studying this particular advanced glycation end product because it's also the most predominant one, this, this precursor. And it fits really well because it comes from glycolysis. We've been interested in understanding um, one very interesting question in, in, in dietary section is when, when you eat less, you shift over to fat metabolism. So we've shown previously shifting over to fat metabolism is, is good and that, that that's beneficial. And if you prevent that switch, then you don't get the benefits of dietary restriction. But the converse question is also just as interesting. Is there, what is it about not using sugar that's, that's, um, that's beneficial? Why is sugar toxic in some way? And, and that's why we've been very interested in understanding glycation as a sort of uh, driver of the damage that comes from um, using more glycolysis. So that's why we got into more methylglyoxal and, and we had a, um, a really elegant model in, in worms where you can get recapitulate diabetic complications within a few days. The, the problem with studying glycation, the other problem with studying glycation is it takes decades to have the uh, um, advanced glycation end products in humans accumulate. But in, a, in, a, in C. elegans, we can see what are like equivalent to early signs of diabetic neuropathy and, and diabetes within three, four days. So that's really allowed us to test genes and compounds to really reverse all this. And so we published a very interesting paper on, on this, um, modeling this and also showing that the that alpha lipoic acid, which is actually 
uh, used uh, commonly used uh, for diabetic complications uh, in several countries and and even in the US that can rescue all the the production of methyl glyoxal and the diabetic complications in our model. So we, we kind of knew we were on the right path, even though it's a C. elegans model um, that we thought it would have some translational value because we identified a pathway that seems to be conserved from worms to, to mammals. Um, and we could identify compounds that could also mitigate this uh, disaster for worms. And so you've packaged uh, this, uh... I guess a, a bunch of things that were targeting the methylglyoxal mechanism. Um, and you found that it reduced appetite and you put that into a, a product now for. Oh yeah, so in between, uh, so I wanna say from the from C. elegans, then we did a, um, a screen with the, you know, about a thousand compounds and identified other hits. Um, and we were looking at both drug-like molecules and supplements in it. You know what caught our eye is that a lot of supplements um, were hits and were, if not, you know, were if uh, most times were either better or just as good as any drug-like molecules. And we wanted a, a path for translation, so we we sort of said, okay, we could just take the supplements and see what happens. So we tried this experiment to just combine them, and to our surprise, we got the combinations working really well. And I just want to add here that. You know, I'm I'm a big believer that you know, though it's very hard to find combinations um, to further extend lo longevity. Uh, once in a while, um, you can hit upon a good one. And uh, we've previously published a paper where we combined the DAF2 signaling and the TOR pathway mutants, and uh, we got a five-fold extension in lifespan. So I think uh, the right combinations, and I should say, most experiments combinations actually fail, but. We did this systematically and tried hundreds of combinations from the hits we had. And from that, we came up with a, a mixture of five compounds that when we added, uh, they had synergistic effect, which meant that we were adding them at a, like a fifth of the dose and they were way, way better than a single compound alone. So uh, you, uh, using the synergy to sort of uh, test for protection in neurons, in mammalian neurons against methylglyoxal or advanced glycation and and product toxicity, we came up this uh, um, uh, uh, mixture of compounds, which we uh, then sort of uh, patented and sort of formed a company around because of the sort of really remarkable effects we're seeing. Yeah. And so full disclosure, uh, I don't like supplements in general. I just, I think that they're just generally not good. Um, but the tie between the advanced location end products and caloric restriction here is really interesting. And so um, it looks like you came up with a, this product called Glylo and it has uh, five components to it. Um, I wanted to go over like each one uh, individually. So ALA, um, from what I understand, it's actually very common in foods, but what, what specifically does it do for um, yeah, I, I want to say I think in supplements, one of the things we don't, I don't, I see supplements uh, differently uh, than I used to. I mean, yes, I think uh, one can sort of uh, keep, you know, ask the question of vitamin C and vitamin E and things like that work. And single compound studies um, can show, you know, have not been as successful to extend longevity. Nevertheless, I want to point out, uh, you know, vitamin C and some of these vitamins have actually saved. Uh, millions of lives. If you think of the time from from the 1800s when you know when it was discovered, one of the first right. clinical trials was really with vitamin C, and and uh, when people realized that was um, uh, uh, deficiency was causing diseases, um, and just replacement actually saved a lot of people. So that that was one thing. But what we are now entering is a different phase where we're now asking the question where um, where are certain compounds given at, at higher doses, are they protective? So I, I think nicotinamide is a very good example. Alpha-lipoic acid is also a very good example. As you know, alpha-lipoic acid has many clinical trials done on and, and is used in several countries for, for, di for diabetes. Now in America, it's, in the US, it's considered a supplement, but in most other countries, it's, it's prescribed by doctors for, for, for diabetes, right? So, I mean, it's a matter of um, um, sort of, a, it's arbitrary what you want to call a supplement, what you right. want to call a drug. Right. It, it's they're all really compound. The the important thing that I want to say about the the four um, the four um, 
um, the vitamins and the lipoic acid that we have are, I think they're all, to think of them, they're Im as important um, cofactors for a number of enzymes in our body, right? And and what we're finding is that having them at, at um, at the doses we are providing them, that they are they're safe for humans, and most importantly, they are essentially shifting the animal towards what I think is close to akin to a, a fasted state, or or their their influencing appetite. So I think that's the important thing. And piperine uh, happens to also sort of enhance stress responses, reduce glycation, and can even mimic melanocortins, which are relevant for food intake. So together, we found again like. Um, we were targeting methylglyoxal and aging and diabetic complications. But as soon as we gave it to the mouse, we found something very interesting that it reduced appetite dramatically. So first we thought there was something wrong with our you know, diet or something and they were just don't, didn't like the diet, but it's turned out that's not the case that they actually specifically affect sugar cravings and, and uh, the food and it's really um, influ influencing uh, carbohydrate intake and um, and it, it uh, seems to be a real effect. Yeah. Have you guys looked at um, the some kind of a tie between triggering maybe like a ketogenic state of metabolism using this these compounds that you've you've got assembled here? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So uh, yes, yeah, so I think this works. I would say one step before what we're finding is this is influencing the choice uh, for the animals to have less carbohydrates. Secondly, it's influencing metabolism. So you're burning more fat, but we haven't uh, gone deeply into looking at what happens to ketogenesis. But my guess is this should initiate ketogenesis faster than it would normally, because the key thing you need for uh, ketogenesis would be first reduction of carbohydrates. Right. Okay. Um, but I did want to kind of go over like each of the components individually and just ask some, some questions. So ALA, it's, it's pretty common. I think it's pretty well known. Um, nicotinamide is often associated instead with NAD plus therapy. Um, is that, what, what yes, is it doing we, here? Yeah, we, we're looking into this. Nicotinamide seems to be an important, uh, important against also against defenses uh, against glycation. And uh, um, we think, um, well, any nicotinamide will also in elevate NAD uh, plus, even though NMA and NR are, are used now. But um, there's no evidence to my knowledge that in vivo nicotinamide um, can't do the job. Maybe you need higher doses, slightly higher doses. But I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really uh, be sure that um, you can't get some of the effects from NMN and NR also with nicotinamide, albeit maybe at a at a different at a slightly higher dose. But we've kept that because that's what was working well in our combinations, and also um, 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 we don't want the cost of this to be prohibitive. So, um, and it, it was very efficacious in our in all our uh, animal studies. Yeah. And the other component is thymine and pyridoxamine. And what's interesting, both of them have also been suggested to be um, uh, previously shown to be like anti-glycation uh, products, uh, but they've been used singly essentially. And, and what we think is the combination, what it does is it brings together these molecules, which may be acting in concert essentially. And that's, why, that's what may explain the sort of the synergy between the components that we've identified. Okay, and then um, I think you talked about piperine a, a little bit already, but that's the last yeah, one. Yeah, piperine is uh, something that um, is used to increase bioavailability, but that's not the reason we were you were using it here. We are we think it also um, enhances stress responses and uh, even mimics uh, um, um, melanocortin. So there's a lot of studies on piperine. I think having its own biological properties. Uh, so we we think that. That's why it is. It was protective in our assays, and and it combined really well with the other components. So, um, basically, if you wanted to, you could eat tons of food that had each of these components in them um, at at a certain rate, and and get this combination. But ostensibly, this is going to be a, a faster and and more efficient way of delivering the right combination of um, the 
I guess it would be micronutrients at or at this point or, or I think micronutrients are the right word to use for for this and I, I what um, I mean you you can't get um, these from foods that easily I mean so uh, yes like you know the B vitamins are available are, are present at high levels in like liver and um, for example in eggs but um, they they would be a thousandfold less than what we are providing in, with the with the mm. supplement. So that's why I think that is the 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 option. And I I think the the data that we're getting in mice and and uh, is is what's compelling us that this is a this is beyond just uh, you know taking like vitamin C to improve your health. It, there might be more more here, which I think we are very sort of excited to sort of. Uh, look into deeper yeah nice well sounds very interesting and um i'll include links to the research that you guys have put out in the description below um and is there any any last words or yeah i think what, what you were talking about one of the other things we're learning is like how uh, when to take these compounds so we're figuring all these things out as well but it's interesting like the the some of these b vitamins and lipoic acid they're water soluble so one idea is to take them um, on an empty stomach they're more the, the, there's some studies showing that they're you can reach higher levels in the blood that way but um, you know it can also um, some people find it harder so they can have it with food but we're, we're working on we think it's better to have it in the the morning for example when you want to switch over um, you know when you're more when you're going to be more glycolytic um, so you um, uh, rather than at night when you switch over to fat metabolism anyway so these are some of the interesting questions um, and a lot of research remains in this area to sort of understand how um, how how to take it, when to take it, and what are the different sort of effects we 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 expect to see with this? Okay, well, thanks for spending time with us, and uh, good to see you again. And um, looking forward to what you might find out in the future with uh, metabolism studies. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, good luck to you. Yeah. <laughs>